Today's uh, keynote is Suzanne Lindsay, and uh, we're actually really proud of Suzanne because she is uh, LTU alum, Civil Engineering of 2001. So uh, I'm going to just read a few things of her bio here. So Lindsay joined the nation's largest grocery uh, retailer in March as the first director of sustainability. In that role, she will direct Kroger's international sustainability initiatives and lead the company's sustainability research team. So at, at lunchtime, we were talking about that's both a, a good thing and, a, and perhaps a scary thing or an unknown. She gets to be the first director, the founding director of sustainability. So she's allowed to kind of create her own career path, but then she doesn't really have a path to follow. So that's mm -hmm. something that's going to be pretty interesting to hear about, I think. So, and the rest of the bio, actually, I think is going to be is available online. So at this point, I think I'd really like to turn over to Suzanne and let her tell her story. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I should start off in the, you know, complete transparency. I have not been back on campus in 11 years, and it may or may not be due to the fact that I have an outstanding parking ticket. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I thought I would do today is to kick this off with a video that ponders what if. I'd like to share that with you. Where did you put it? What if they reduce landfill waste to zero at half their manufacturing plants? What if they donated 125 million meals to help feed the hungry in our communities? What if they were named the most generous company in America? What if they ensure fresh, sustainable seafood for future generations? What if they saved almost one billion plastic bags from being used? What if we told you we already had? We're working hard to reduce our impact on the environment. And improve the lives of our customers, associates, and the communities that we serve. And we're just getting started. What if we donated even more fresh produce to feed the hungry? What if we used more alternative fuels in the trucks that deliver food? What if we made it simpler to find more natural and organic foods in your store? What if we all improve one thing today to protect tomorrow? So I don't know about you guys, but I am, I'm like a proud mama every time I see that. These are some of the highlights of what we've been able to accomplish over the last few years. And what I thought we could do today was to dive in a little bit deeper, provide some updates. We'll first start about you know who is a Kroger company. I'll share with you so you get an idea of size and scale of who we are. Uh, talk about our approach, some of the goals and the progress that we're making, and then talk about some of the communication and engagement efforts that we're pursuing. So yeah, our business by the numbers, we are a $90 billion company. We have 349,000 associates. We operate in 31 states under 17 different banners. Of course, here in southeastern Michigan is Kroger. Uh, we have over 2,400 supermarkets. 788 convenience stores. I did not know this when I joined Kroger. We have 342 jewelry stores, over 1,100 fuel centers, and 37 food processing plants. So as we go through sort of the, uh, the projects that I'm sharing with you, it really gives you sort of some size and scale as to types of impacts that we have in the business, and also the projects that we're doing to try and reduce those impacts. So when we think about sustainability, uh, you know, our Customers, our associates, and our shareholders expect us to engage in the communities that we operate to minimize our impact on the environment and to create positive economic value. So more and more, we are considering the social, the environmental, and economic impacts of the business decisions that we make every single day. So we do, we have a, a commitment to serve in our communities, and we actually concentrate on five specific areas that our customers have told us are important to them. As a supermarket, we realize that we are uniquely positioned to help fight hunger. Uh, what this illustrates here is that uh, about 66 million pounds of food were donated 
through our grocery stores. And with funds, so the, the pounds and funds were donated to 80 local food banks within the Feeding America network to a total of 160 million meals, which is actually an update to the 2010 number you just saw in the video, which was 125 million. So we're continuing to raise the bar. How we do that, I thought I'd share, um, particularly with this audience, how we do that. So there's a, a, a process that we call the PDP, or the Perishable Donation Partnership. Why I share it with you here today is because it really illustrates, I think, is a stellar example of that triple bottom line that we're looking for. From the social perspective, we're helping to feed the, hung and the hungry in our uh, communities. Today, one in six Americans are food insecure, meaning they're not quite sure where their next meal is coming from. Um, from an environmental perspective, we are keeping organics out of the landfill, which is becoming an increasing concern. And in fact, we've been targeted by the EPA to pay attention. And so we're trying to look at alternative ways that we can help do that. And then from an economic perspective, we're saving about $1.2 million in waste hauling costs associated with uh, helping to donate. We also have a focus with uh, uh, helping the military and their families through the USO. Our partnership started in 2010 with them and have had the opportunity to raise about $3.2 million. As well, our customers have told us that women's health, uh, particularly breast cancer, is important to them. Uh, we've also donated, within last year, about three and a half million dollars to help support treatment, awareness. Um, I should also mention, too, the other two, I didn't uh, have any slides related, but um, disaster relief is also a, a way that we can help with our local communities. And then also, uh, through our community rewards program, if you all have a, a Kroger Plus card, you can help to um, choose where you want your dollars to go uh, just by purchasing power. And so that helps local schools, nonprofits, churches, et cetera. And as a result of all of those efforts and those commitments that we've made, we have uh, recently been named the most generous company in America by Forbes Company, which is a wonderful institution. So we switch gears a little bit here. Uh, we think about how we can enable customer sustainability through providing choices for our customers. Uh, Kroger has been a leader in animal welfare. Um, and I wanted to share with you, and again, it starts by the, the power of the dollar that you have in the, ch the choices that you make when you decide to purchase something from our stores. And uh, an area of focus for us has um, been cage-free eggs, and we sold 192 million cage-free eggs last year alone, and we've uh, seen a 10% increase year over year. Um, in fact, you see the Simple Truth brand down here, which is a natural cage-free uh, grain-fed, and this is a new a brand that we've launched, and we'll, you'll see more and more natural and organics uh, show up in Kroger stores across the U.S. I think this is probably one of the biggest areas that we have uh, a major impact and potential to improve on. Um, you know, when we think about seafood and the inherent problems that come along the supply chain, you know, more and more, it's no longer about the, the goods that we sell, it's about looking up the value chain, down the value chain, and where can we make positive impacts across that. And we found that seafood is an area that we can do just that. Uh, you know, our customers expect us to and trust us to make the right decisions, to thoughtfully procure, and to be locally relevant. And uh, I, I bring this up because most of the moms and dads that come to our seafood shops, you know, might have this, you know, recall a story on tuna or sea bass or something they might not know a whole lot about, but they trust us to make the right decisions. And so uh, I've worked a lot with our seafood team the, the last few months to understand sort of what can we do to ensure fresh, sustainable seafood for uh, generations to come. And it's really through this mindset or approach of engagement. So we engage our, with our suppliers. They are partners of ours. And it's sort of this idea or approach that we found in common with the World Wildlife Fund, who we partnered with in 2009 to help us um, make meaningful commitments get access to the science-based data that we need to help make better business decisions. And I wanted to share with you, um, through that partnership, we were able to come up with a commitment that uh, we stated that we would uh, source our top 20 wild-caught, fresh, and frozen species, say that 10 times, <laughs> uh, to either be Marine Stewardship Council certified, to be in a full assessment, or to be engaged in a fishery improvement project. Um, as of last, January, we were at 65%. I 
I did a quick check before I came here. We're actually at 68%. So we are moving the needle in this space and continuing to do well by doing good. I also wanted to show you some of the fruits of that effort. It seems like a really far <laughs> down the supply chain, but this, this to me is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the change is happening on the water and the investments that Kroger has made to engage fisheries rather than abandoning them. To um, So this is proof, proof positive of what we're doing. We're helping to, um, helping fisheries help themselves, in fact. And I'm uh, really, really proud of the, the uh, fish that are, that are shown here, the Indonesian tuna, the snapper, the grouper, the mahi-mahi efforts. And I'm actually gonna get the opportunity next year to go uh, see what's going on you know, on the water for, uh, relative to our tuna efforts. So I really wanted to share that with you today that you know, just because we're a supermarket, we seem really, really far down the chain from this, but this, these are the types of opportunities that we have to make key investments um, to ensure that we are providing sustainable seafood to our customers. So here's my particular sort of sphere of influence, and it's about you know, reducing or minimizing our impact on the environment. Uh, we uh, key in on four specific areas to reduce energy consumption and our carbon footprint. We want to reduce waste, increase recycling rates. We'd like to increase transportation efficiencies, and then reduce the use of plastic bags and increase the use of reusable bags. So we think about reducing energy use, you know, we've aggressively pursued this over the last 10 or 12 years. And as a result, our overall, looking at store overall energy consumption has reduced by actually, an update is 32%, uh, which is a, a pretty amazing number when you think of the, the amount of facilities that we have and the energy that we do use. And so sort of think about that in a different way. That's a savings of about 1.4 billion kilowatt hours. That's enough energy to power every home in the city of Columbus for one entire year. If you want to think about it in terms of uh, greenhouse gas equivalents, it's taking about 260,000 cars off the road for one whole year. If you think about how we're doing that, we've been aggressively pursuing Energy Star certifications. Uh, we've leveraged about 500,000 LED retrofits. Um, we've actually even um, partnered with a vendor of ours and challenged them to make a better wrapper sealer, which is used in our deli and in our produce department. And as a result, it's an 80%, it uses 80% less energy and we've used that across all of our stores. So all of these efforts um, allowed us to just recently, I was in Washington DC on Tuesday night and had the opportunity to uh, help accept the award from the Alliance to Save Energy, where we were, um, recognized for our efforts in energy efficiency and uh, won the Galaxy Awards. So we're really, really proud of this work and the impact that it's having. We're also adding to our suite some renewables. In our Turkey Hill dairy farm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we have two uh, wind turbines that are working hard for us about, uh, the, it was, I think the first full year was about five and a half um, million kilowatt hours that it, it helped uh, offset our energy needs. We also have four stores that have PV. Um, one of the largest um, commercial PV systems is actually in our Clackamas Portland uh, distribution center. Uh, it's a, a massive system and it's uh, working hard for us. About 8 to 10 percent of our energy needs are, are offset by that effort. Uh, Fred Meyer in Portland is also a big leader of ours in <laughs> testing um, some of these new technologies. And then of course you guys have some electric vehicles on site. We've got about 40 right now in our um, Fred Meyer. We, we use the Blink system from Ecotality. We're, we're the retail partner for multiple installations, a part of their uh, Department of Energy um, incentives structure that we're able to sort of build out that infrastructure, enable some of the, the electric vehicles that we have in our stores. So in a, we want to come at it. We're going to probably we're looking at a proposal right now for maybe 100 or more new installations. So, with all of these efforts, you know, um, working hard on our transportation efficiencies, our uh, logistics team is extremely passionate in this space. And we think about food productivity. We attack it in three different ways. First is through our cube efficiency. You know, we're trying to load our trucks to capacity. We're trying to increase our miles per gallon, and we're trying to reduce the amount of empty miles and get a little bit smarter about how we transport our goods. And as a result of all of those efforts, we've been able to increase our fleet productivity by 25.5% since 2008, and we have a pretty aggressive goal to meet about 40% by 2015, and we're well, well on our way. 
All of these efforts then have translated into a lower carbon footprint for us. And for 2011, it's been about um, 2%. We're pretty proud of that number considering um, we are growing in size and in sales. And when you think about sort of all the different efforts that go into this, and to nudge that number down is uh, quite a hard thing to do. But we're pretty proud of the fact that we've been able to see some uh, improvement in that space. I'm going to switch gears here, but we think about you know, recycling and how customers can participate as well. And, you know, this notion of the evil plastic bag, right? And uh, so we provide a, an opportunity for those who want to participate in our bag-to-bag -bag program um, to do so. So we've seen about a 10% increase uh, from 2010, so we recycled 20 and a half um, million pounds of recyclable bags, as well as the shrink that um, comes out of the backside of a, a store. We also have over 45 million uh, reusable plastic containers, uh, or RPCs, in circulation. They primarily are used to protect and transport our produce. Um, clearly, this offsets a tremendous amount of the cardboard boxes that we would be using, and we're finding more and more applications. If you some, uh, some of you, your local Kroger, if you were to pay attention in the egg aisle, uh, some of the RPCs are now being used to, for shelf-ready packaging, so we don't have to worry about um, a multitude of things. I mean, these RPCs are really, uh, you're going to see a lot more and more of these, uh, especially in store. We've also, where uh, cardboard still is still actually a revenue stream for us, so uh, when we can, we try and bail it. 1.14 billion pounds were recycled last year. And, you know, as we're raising the bar for ourselves, it requires us to think innovatively. And uh, remember I said earlier about the food waste and that the EPA is, is looking at us and saying, you guys can do a better job of this to keep um, you know, food waste out of the landfill. So sell what you can, donate what you can, and then find a better way to do it. And um, I absolutely love this project. It, it, it really exemplifies sort of what we're trying to accomplish from a social, environmental, and economic effort. It is a, a unique system. It's uh, never been done quite in this way before in the US. And it is uh, the opportunity here, the upside is, is limitless in my opinion. And the, the minds and the engineers that came together to make this thing a reality is, is pretty cool. So I'm going to try my best here to explain a fairly complex process. But the idea is that um, this is on site in our urban distribution center in Compton, California. Um, the idea is that we will backhaul. It serves about 400 stores of ours. We will backhaul the food waste to the distribution center. It has, uh, it comes in these big reusable plastic containers, these big giant banana boxes, if you will. And uh, I'm gonna actually show you. This, you guys are the only crowd that I could actually show a picture, a process map. Look, the, the guy that I was sharing with us earlier, uh, he said, That's, you cannot show that to people. And I'm like, you have no idea. I'm going to Lawrence Tech University. These people know what we're looking at here. But what's funny about it is, you know, when it gets in the hands of the, the marketing people, it, you know, that goes away and, and this is what you get, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go back to another one. It's going to be more fun. <laughs> uh, so you can see here that, you know, the, the food waste comes back and gets put into this resource recovery system. I call it a hungry, hungry hippo. And um, what it does is it, it grinds the, the food. It uh, creates what they call a milkshake or a slurry. Not a milkshake that I'm interested in trying, but um, it, you know, it raises certain heat. There's also a food manu uh, manufacturing plant on site that has wastewater. And so we bring in that wastewater from the, the food processing plant. It then gets mixed into this slurry. It does the voodoo that it does, and it ends up in this 2 million gallon uh, anaerobic digester on site. And that's where all the magic happens, right? That's where this bacteria or this feed um, feeds on the carbon in the organics and it creates this um, biogas. The biogas is sort of that renewable energy then is converted to electricity. And there's a couple of different byproducts which makes it really, really cool is the fact that we're able to offset about 20% of our on-site um, <coughs> electricity needs. We're uh, able to, as a result of this, is, they call it sludge cake, but it's basically a, a soil amendment. And we're able then to provide that to local farmlands to reintroduce nutrients into the land. And then um, the permeate, or it, which is actually just a, a water which we can either go down the sanitary sewer or reintroduce into the system as needed. So, uh, I mean, this is really a, I'm very, very proud of this effort. It's been a long time coming. 
um, and we really think it's going to change the landscape and how retailers particularly um, manage food waste streams. So, all right, we'd like the, the process yet. So when we think about being innovative, with, you know, we need to think about being innovative with our suppliers, and I, and I love this story. I'll go through, go through this. This is how you make cattle when they were fun at Kroger, right? Uh, there is a, a really fantastic farm in northern Indiana called Fair Oaks, and uh, one of the farmers there is one of the most unique and interesting men I've ever met. He uh, has no boundaries. He thinks of, he sees a problem, he fixes it, and he goes to the next step. And as a result of the partnership with Kroger, he's been able to invest sustainably in his operations. And this is just one example of how he's doing that. So imagine you have 30,000 cows on this farm, all producing manure. And so he uh, puts it into an anaerobic digester, but rather than turning it into electricity, he's then chosen to convert it to compressed natural gas, which is then used to transport the milk to our manufacturing plants and it's I mean it's an absolutely closed loop system it's really impressive and uh, the US Innovation Dairy Center has done an LCA or life cycle analysis on this particular farm and it uh, actually reduces or emits 51 percent less carbon than an average dairy farm in the United States so uh, we're really really proud to be a part of this uh, particular project and if you're ever on your way to Chicago it's a great place to stop some of the best milkshakes and grilled cheese I've ever had. <laughs> Just saying. So we're on a journey toward zero waste. Our manufacturing plants have really been uh, a leader in this space. You saw in the video that 19 of our 37 have gone zero waste to the landfill. Um, it's really been a fantastic effort. The, the associates are proud of it, um, and we really wanted to learn, you know, in the manufacturing environment. And what does that mean to be zero waste in a retail environment? And what will it take to get us there? And I found out really quickly um, when I joined Kroger that we needed to have uh, one definition, one approach, and, and one voice towards zero waste. There are lots and lots of different um, you know, ways to look at it. And so we uh, joined up with the EPA WasteWise program. Um, their definition is 90% or better that is diverted from landfill or in, or, and incinerator and um, are really in the stages right now of figuring out what that looks like. If, if we are you know, around 55% diversion rate right now in a retail environment, how do we get you know, to that next level? And I wanted to share um, you know, some of those, those efforts in stores, and you saw in the video that we are trying to um, divert as much as we can and help our uh, customers and associates to get better. We've been able to uh, divert over one billion plastic bags from being used. Uh, we've also um, increased our selling of reusable bags to the tune of about 14,200 per day, which I think is pretty cool. So it's one thing to, to do all this stuff. It's another thing to try and effectively communicate it. And uh, we recently uh, launched this website, which is it's just a, a real simple way to sort of navigate how um, some of the highlights, you get to see the cow power, you get to see a multitude of other um, projects that, that we're doing. Um, you get to see sort of some of the projects across the US in your neighborhood. Um, if you want to check out the, the microsite on seafood, if you want to see the what if video, or if you are really interested in hearing the entire story, you can download the sustainability report. Um, relative to in-store communication, I wanted to highlight this effort in Lawrence, Kansas. And um, you know this this particular community is highly engaged, uh, highly educated in sustainability, and they basically said uh, it was our Dylan's banner in in Lawrence, and they said you know build a better store, you guys need to build a better store and operate a better store, and we listened, and we said okay, what does what does that look like? And so um, a lot of the things that we were doing, we just didn't we didn't talk about it, uh, we didn't share it, and so we decided to try and find a unique way and, and sort of fun way and create a store experience that highlights some of the things that, that we do do. You know, like we use the skylights and we're able to turn fluorescents off in the retail space. We're, you know, um, we are Energy Star. We're designing to Energy Star for all of our new stores. Uh, this store actually is 30% per square foot more efficient than the previous Dillon's, which was 20% <coughs> uh, smaller. So we're doing a lot more in, uh, relative to uh, energy efficiency in this space. There's also a huge um, nod to the, the local natural organics and sourcing 
uh, like the flower power. We source all of our, in Kansas, you know, it's important to these people that they have a, a local relevance in the products that they're buying, um, and started to tell that story as well. We also teamed up with a small company called Unilever, which is actually the largest um, consumer goods um, giant in the world, and they have a pretty aggressive goal of doubling their business and having their uh, carbon footprint. And so we decided to team up together and try and tell that product story across the store. And you can see here an example of uh, one of the shelf tags. So you might not know who Unilever is, but you certainly know who Dove is and Ragu and Ben and & Jerry's. And they've made significant um, strides in terms of nutrition, in terms of packaging. And so we decided to get together, particularly in this store, to tell that whole story. So we started with what if, and I go back to what if, and I find it you know, exciting, especially with the people in this room, if you would have told me you know, 10, 11 years ago that I would be director of sustainability, uh, one of the largest retailers in the world, I, I probably would have laughed out loud. And uh, you know, I was a civil engineering graduate. I um, went directly into the land development world and went to work for retailers, and I designed sites for them for about 10 years. And it's sort of been a journey since then. And I ask this question a lot. I have lots of things that go, go on in my mind, and I have a big whiteboard that I call my um, stream of consciousness, right? So I ha I'll have a crazy idea, and I'll write it down. And I will tell you that the, the skills that I learned here at LCU, the critical thinking skills, the analytical skills, are really um, what has helped me be successful in this realm. So I get to stretch my mind, and I get to, to think about things a little bit differently. I get to challenge my business peers in the business units to think about things a little differently. So where I used to come from a very sort of science-based analytical place, I've now, I now realize that there are social impacts. I now realize that there, you have to have a business case and a value proposition, especially in a company as big as Kroger. So um, I just want to challenge you. When you think about your careers or what you're doing, you know, what are the impacts, the positive impacts that you can have? You know, what if whatever? What if, ask the question. Because there's so many possibilities, and it's such an exciting time. Um, you know, I feel honored and, and blessed that I have the role that I get to create at Kroger, and it's it's all upside. There's so many opportunities and so many positive impacts that we can make, and still be a fantastic, growing company. So I appreciate your time here today, and I want to say thank you. So we actually have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, so, the typical Kroger that I think of is kind of situated in a kind of supermarket setting with, you know, outlaw and a lot of parking. Is Kroger shifting at all towards more of like a smaller store setting that's closer to these downtown areas that are kind of coming back or these urban cores? Yeah, so uh, we are considering small format stores, um, certainly some in urban areas. If, um, in one of the very first slides I've shared, we have over 788 convenience stores, and we really, they're already in you know, uh, smaller urban settings. And we've actually introduced um, some perishables into those stores to help get uh, some natural uh, and perishables in there as well. So the combination between what, all, what infrastructure already exists and then looking at um, you know, growing urban markets absolutely is a consideration in our, in our, in our radar. I noticed you've highlighted a lot of the, you know, specific cases of improvements that you've made at like specific stores. Um, are any of those examples occurring in Michigan? They are. So when we have a, a retrofit, uh, we come in, we evaluate, you know, what we can do. Are there opportunities to uh, retrofit the lighting? Uh, by the end of this year, all every Kroger banner will have had the uh, the LED retrofits. Uh, we look at trans when we can. We go from VCT tile to polished concrete tile or polished concrete. Um, so they are all considered. Well, are, I mean, are you going to be piloting anything cool in Michigan? It sounds like you know you're piloting a lot of these like really you know novel ideas that are having big impacts, but they're occurring you know across the nation. And just as someone that's really interested in Michigan as being like you know pioneers of sustainability. To, to be honest, I don't know of anything specific in the state of Michigan okay. at this time. Um, this may be common knowledge, but uh, are you guys doing anything in Detroit? I think we have one or two stores in Detroit proper, but I don't know for a fact. 
to be honest. Okay. Sorry, back here was. Yeah, uh, getting back to the part about your big uh, uh, waste digester and the co-generator plant, is that something that you plan to install in each store? Would that be centrally located where you then take the material from each of your outlets? And bring it so this is a, a, a very complex, large, I mean, large, large system and really would only be applicable in this current format in a large distribution center where there's already back hauling occurring. Um, so will this happen in every store? Uh, not like that, no. Um, will we be able to leverage at other distribution centers? I think so. So then deploy it regionally or one per state or? How big is the distribution yeah. Distribution center, the Ralph's Food for Loss Distribution Center is our largest. I honestly could not tell you um, how big that is. It serves 400 of our Southern California stores. I just wanted to say the store in Lawrence, Kansas, that you showed, the, the particular sign that was there had an arrow pointing up in the skylights and how you're saving electricity. Are a lot of those signs being used in, or are those signs being used in all of your stores? No, this was the very first store where we were, uh, had a desire to communicate what we were doing from uh, an overall sustainability perspective. So not just the energy story, but also the, you know, the fact that we were, this was our first retail uh, zero waste store and to highlight the products as well. The point though is that I wanted to do it here is to show that this was a community that cares and it's middle America. Sustainability is no longer reserved for Portland's and San Francisco's of the world and so what I intend to do is to um, find the data that backs that up. Is this working? Was it effective? And are there sales lists? Um, do the work from a, you know, an analytical perspective to, to raise that up and say Hey leadership, check this out. You know this this is working because um, you can imagine in a Kroger store there is lots and lots of messages to share, and um, and sometimes maybe sustainability doesn't get a get a priority. Well, the first I, for, I should say you know first and foremost we're, we're trying to sell stuff, right? So the, the price always. Uh, my point is that the growing consumer, these millennials, actually care about. Uh, the social and the environmental piece as well, and that this is sort of a first step or foray into that space and communicating it in a way that they get the full message. And, and that was my point too, actually, because I believe Lawrence, Kansas was the city in which Walmart built their first store with skylights. Uh, I don't know sure if there's a Walmart. The King, Texas, was their first sort of real test pilot where they put a lot of their um, sort of sustainability efforts into. I'm not sure about, I don't know if it's a Walmart in Lawrence. It's kind of a unique town. Well, Walmart found that when they put skylights in, everything that they put under the skylights sold better. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen that report, and I, uh, yeah, I think they said a 5% sale lift, which I find, we'll see, I don't know. <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. Yeah, I do have uh, two questions. That you talked about sustainable food and everything, but do Kroger um, take the food from the local farmer, or is there a big change? So that's that? so that's what's really cool about Kroger is the fact that you know we're this behemoth of a company, but the fact that we have 17 separate divisions that are regionally based, um, we we're able to you know thoughtfully procure but make it locally relevant. So yes, we have we provide the opportunity for uh, local farmers when they have the ability to meet the quality standards that, um, that we require to sell in our store. So um, you know, in Warwick store example, so, so flour, beef. Uh, I mean, there's over a thousand. I think it's a thousand SKUs of local food that are in that store. So there is the ability not to just always have the national brands, but we do leverage that for our size, but then make it locally relevant. And I also was um, thinking about that you put the recycling back program. But it's just a general question as a general public mind that can't we stop using plastic bags that if you will start providing paper bags and public won't get the plastic bag, what do you 
So it, it's funny that you mentioned that uh, plastic bags are the, the bane of my existence. I'm tracking about 75 different uh, taxes, bans. Um, I would very much like it to be, you know, a legislative effort at a, at a national level rather than a patchwork of because we do five cent taxes in Seattle. We have bans, you know, in other places. Um, you know, you it's just all over the map. You have to provide recycling in some places. In some places you don't, and so it becomes sort of an operational nightmare. Um, everything's out of the table as far as we're concerned. We do a, a lot of uh, customer insights to find out. Um, what they want and, and today it's you know it's make it simple make it convenient and usually that translates to you know plastic or paper and, and there's a million different LCAs around both that would tell you one is more damaging than the other um, so more to, more to come on that today you know we're trying to do more to make our baggers more effective and fill the bags and not double bag uh, create the opportunity to recycle um, if they want to um, and raise awareness generally did I answer your question? Uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it'd be great to say ban it. Um, you know, they're banned in Ireland and they're doing just fine. What about your efforts in the fuel centers? What are you doing there? Pardon? Your efforts in the fuel centers? Um, that's a good question. We're selling gas. However, the electric vehicle uh, market is growing and there are several of the blink systems that are on site and we're trying to also cater to that growing number of customers as well. Yes? I'm always interested in how large companies get going when we talk about sustainability. Is this something that went from the top down or did it come from the grassroots up or was it a bit of both? That's a great question. Um, so my boss, who's the, the group vice president, and she is our chief sustainability officer, and it was uh, really her that sort of led this effort. So um, her and our CEO, Dave Dillon, uh, realized that there was a, a growing trend. This was a mega trend and identified as one. And so how do we get involved? And it started, um, you can imagine, in, a, in the grocery business, it's all about margin. And so our uh, we realized that there was a value proposition. And so they started, um, you know, with the energy efficiency efforts over you know, 10, 11 years ago, and it's just grown from there. And um, I think that we've done a lot. You know, I've been there six months. I still, um, I still don't know what I don't know, and I'm learning and more and more. And I'm very much in a listening and understanding and trying to learn the business so that where I can find other opportunities to dovetail into um, you know, where we want to head. So I would say that we are in a place of, we, we've had lots of successes within the different business units, but now it's about bringing it together and being a little bit more proactive and strategic in how we're pursuing things going forward. Yes. What are some of the specific challenges in the area of waste reduction that you're facing, other than bears? Yeah, sure. So um, we follow up the EPA's hierarchy, and um, so when I think about uh, a typical Kroger store, we have a, we manage about eight to ten contracts in every store. So fat and bone, corrugate, uh, food waste. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so the challenge comes with so if you you sell what you can, you donate what you can. I'm talking more around food waste at this point. Um, so the next, we, we manage things really, really well. I mean, Kroger is a, a very efficient operator. Um, but the next step for us is being able to compost. If we want to go from that 50 or 60 percent diversion rate, that next step for us is to figure out how to handle um, composting. And so, you know, my thing about things that keep me up at night is how do we find, sometimes in the municipalities, the infrastructure isn't there. So commercially licensed composting facilities. Um, don't exist in, in some of the regions that we operate. So in order to, you know, we're sort of working behind the scenes then to figure out how do we increase the amount um, of commercially available composting facilities. So that's that next tier that we're really sort of trying to, to figure out. And then beyond that, um, you think about, gosh, uh, getting creative. I mean, it really is requiring us to think very, very differently. Um, and some problems haven't been solved yet, but the idea is the stake has been, our, you know, COO has said, we need to get towards zero waste in our retail environment, so how do we how do we do that, figure it out? And so that's what we're starting to do. Well, food waste is. Food waste is a massive, massive, uh, yeah, massive concern and problem, and uh, if we can reduce our 
costs if we can uh, do something right and minimize our impact on the environment and do the right thing. We would, I mean, it's a win-win all around. Yes? I, I, I'm curious about a couple of things, I guess. So one would be, so we were just talking about composting. You say commercially available composting centers. Have you ever worked with municipalities? So a lot of municipalities That's have what I'm talking about. that counts as yeah. like commercially yeah. available. It's working with municipalities. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty stringent regulations on getting um, people are, they want uncontaminated, decontaminated. So sometimes it's hard to get, you know, pure composting material outside the back of a, of a grocery store. So it'll be a concerted effort on both sides to figure that out. So, so the other thing I was curious about then is a lot of, a lot of the early questions had a lot to do with, well, what's coming here? You know, there was Compton, there was Kansas, there was several examples, yeah. and we want to know what's, what's coming here next. Is there a, a strategy or a plan for almost like local sustainability officers where, because I mean, if you put up the data, it's 400,000 employees, thousands of stores, there's no way you can go yeah. from store to store and so, say, and, change this, change yeah. that. Is there going to be like a, a hierarchical training or local sustainability so, officers? You know, I'm the director of sustainability, and it's it's me. So, I my and I was talking about sort of moving toward this strategy, right? And so, a part of that is we can leverage our cultural councils and our divisions, and they are groups of folks who are passionate and uh, interested in this space. And so, uh, you know, to your point earlier, Janice, about or is it a top down or or a grassroots? Well, it's got to be both. Right? I mean, you have to inspire the hearts and the minds of the people that are in the stores, and, and how do you get them to do something different than they're, maybe they're not used to doing? Um, and you know, I shared with the Perishable Donation Partnership, and that's actually managed by I mean, hardcore retail operators, but they branded it and they told the story around sustainability. They shared the social benefits, the environmental benefits, and the economic benefits. There's nothing inspiring about saving money for the people in the the ivory tower, right? It was uh, a way for our folks to get involved and to do something uh, that they felt passionate about, and that was where the success came from. And so we're seeing more and more of these efforts where we're, um, you know, trying to communicate through the lens of sustainability to inspire the hearts and minds. And, you're, and we're seeing more and more that that's effective and that's working. So around our energy efficiency efforts, you know, um, what's going to inspire someone to not turn off, you know, the the override button on our uh, EMS system? It's because they know that it's going to save a certain amount of trees. They know that it's going to, you know, and save money and do the right thing. So, I mean, that's sort of where I see it going is trying to harness, you know, taking this mandate from the CEO and the COO, and then how do we sort of activate the people, you know, from a grassroots perspective and then build that infrastructure around. Yes? Um, so, kind of to piggyback off of that, so we just checked them. There aren't any Kroger's in Detroit, which is a major metropolitan city. And I guess I'm just wondering what it would take to, you know, for Kroger to have a presence there. I mean, Detroit is like a national, like global focal point for, you know, experimental, sustainable practice. You know, Whole Foods just built this store there because they identified it as just this like incredible place where all these sustainable efforts are occurring and there's a huge demand and there's already a very low density of grocery stores high need for food security, and I mean, if Kroger is making this huge effort towards sustainability and meeting the needs of the people, why isn't there a presence there? What would it take to get a presence? You know, that's a great question, and we're, we're getting there. We're trying. I mean, it's, I don't have a, a, a thoughtful answer other than Right, I understand you may not be the best person to right. like, ask that question to, but. I, and honestly, I've not visited um, the uh, Michigan division yet to even understand sort of what their outlook is relative to to real estate development. I know that there, there's been retrofits and expansions, but I don't know if there's been um, well, there's any no, new builds per se. No change. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Right. Myers building one at the Gateway Marketplace. Yeah. Right. Just one there. And, and Whole Foods. Not this one, but just started construction of the new place, which is like dominating the media because it's like a great idea and they've been very thoughtful about their implementation so it's been a very beneficial thing for the whole food market as well. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, Part of the reason or uh, the thought behind having this entire conference on sustainable urbanism was to look at shrinking sure. cities like Detroit and come up with solutions. So I think it's great for us to have a voice to you to 
you know, put a bug in your ear to Absolutely. create I mean, Kroger's to teaching, Detroit. Preaching to the choir. So, you know, these are some of the things that I can, you know, take back. I can. I mean, I can. And I can talk to the powers that be that make those types of decisions. Because it's, um, you know, being six months in and, you know, trying to learn the business and find out where my advocates are within the business. You know, it, like I said, it's a very much an influence without authority role. Um, I need to make lots and lots of collaborative efforts. And, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm seeing what's out there today and, and I get excited about what's possible. You know, and so when we take some of these larger scale efforts, you know, what then can we learn best practice and scale it down and where does it make sense? You know, and we're at the start of that. So I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate that feedback. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to like, talk with you about opportunities in Detroit just to kind of, you know, plant that seed and if you're not already aware of the incredible like real estate opportunities and uh, you know just room for development and infrastructure. Yeah, that'd be great. Totally open and willing to listen. Okay. Yes. I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you do. It's very important to the community of Middle America and just so you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Footprint, but in terms of convenience, is uh, what our customers have told us is their number one priority, and as a result, that's why we have over 2,400 stores. We are, um, you know, trying to be locally relevant and available and convenient. So, uh, you know, side bar to that is the fact that you can reduce your, you know, travel time. Okay. Um, but when we think about sort of the urbanization sort of piece of it, um, I think that more and more those decisions are going to have to be made to sustain our own business, right? right? So um, to your point, Whole Foods has moved in. Well, guess what? I'm going back and I'm going to say, well, if Whole Foods is in the city of Chicago, are they making that work? You know, and, you, and what I can do is activate and plant the seed, you know, and, and say, well, what if, what if we do something different here? How can we uh, talk about this? I mean, what are the upsides to doing uh, something like that? Uh, when you, you know, when I, to your point earlier, though, about, you know, how far up or down so, you know, the, the value chain do you want to go, and right. no longer is it, are you allowed to just be a, a, a grocer and sell stuff. Sure. I mean, you have to be um, thoughtful in how you procure things. I mean, right. when we think about, um, I didn't touch on here today, but, uh, you know, emerging issues in uh, palm oil, and when you think about paper, and you think about some of these high-impact commodities that we have to consider, and we're, and we're playing in that space, where we have a seat at the table with the consumer goods forum. We have a seat at the table um, you know, with the, the food manufacturer, grocery manufacturing association. In fact, I just got back from DC. And these are all the conversations that we are having collectively in a pre-competitive environment to say, how do we, if we're going to exist in 10, 15 years, how do we move forward right. as a sustainable supermarket? You know, and those are all the conversations that we're having. And it, it is up and down the supply chain. I mean, down to helping, you know, deforestation in Indonesia right. to being, you know, on, on the water with the fishery improvement projects. I mean, it, there really are no boundaries. It's what you choose to focus on as a business and, and what makes sense for you. Okay, I, this is sort of an announcement and a pitch for the last session of the day, but it's certainly relevant to your talk because uh, one session is on urban gardening and urban farming which is becoming, and up and becoming in Detroit, which it would be great if you could tie into that, okay? And the other session is actually
actually the bringing of Detroit, or the bringing of Team Detroit, which relates to the company that does all the marketing. I'm going to make sure I have this book right. All the marketing for Ford. And uh, what's interesting about this one is it was a grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of ideas that I think that could be shared to for everybody to benefit from. Oh, that's great. Cool. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, as I try to point out ahead of time that we are very proud of Suzanne because she is an alum. So on behalf of our alumni office, we have this framed plaque of the article that was in here. Oh, wow. And I knew it for you. Thank you. So you can take that one. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. I appreciate the, the opportunity.